talk, I understand, about this um, lattice versus continuum exotic field theories for fracton field theories, I guess, and also some subsystem um, symmetric uh, short range entangled phases. And I think it'll be a really interesting um, set of talks. So feel, please feel free to start whenever you, you're ready, Natty. I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yep. Can hear you and I can see your screen. Yeah. Can you see the, friend, the pointer? Mm -hmm. And do you want a two minute warning? Uh, no, I have a, a clock here. Okay, great. I'll just tell you when your time's up. And I hope I will not go over time. So first of all, thank the organizers for inviting me to for putting together this wonderful conference and for inviting me to speak here. Uh, this is the first of three talks. This I'll give kind of an overview and an introduction. And the other two talks will get more into the details. I'd like to thank my fantastic collaborators, Pranay, Hota, Tom, and Shuheng, and of course the UQM Simons collaboration. So over the last several centuries, physics and more generally science, really you had as a principle, the idea of separation of scales. Physics at one length scale or the description at one length scale is almost independent of the details at shorter distances and at longer distances. In the 20th century, in the context of field theory and lattice models, this is known as the renormalization point. And here we start from some system in the context of lattice models, it's a system in the UV at short distances, some lattice system, and it flows along distances to a long distance infrared theory. And this theory is very interesting because it's complete on its own and it's almost independent of most of the details of the short distance theory. And this has been enormously powerful. And the language used to describe the infrared theory is the language of continuum quantum field theory. It was developed in parallel with a lot of cross influence in condensed matter physics and in high energy physics. And the words we use is effective. It's effective in the sense that it's very, it's easier to perform calculations here than here. And it's universal in the sense that most of the details from the short distance theory do not make any appearance at long distances. So we can make changes in short distances which make almost no effect at long distances. And the reason this subject is interesting is twofold. First, by classifying and understanding all possible behavior of quantum field theory, we can see what can be possibly put here. What is the classification of phases of in condensed matter physics. In the opposite direction, if we learn of a new phase in condensed matter physics or a new phase that we find in some lattice model, this would teach us something new about quantum field theory. So this has been the prevailing paradigm in physics in general, but especially in the context of the renormalization group uh, during centuries and in the context of the renormalization group over almost half a century by now. But there are several interesting counterexamples to this paradigm, which I like to call UVIR mixing. It's UVIR mixing in the sense that this separation of scales between what happens at short distances and what happens at long distances is no longer as simple as it's the case in the general case that I mentioned earlier. First of all, this is very common in gravity. If you try to ask questions like what happens at short distances, in the theory of gravity. So even without gravity, what you need to do is you have to concentrate a lot of energy in a small region so that you can explore what happens in that small region. But in the theory of gravity, if you concentrate a lot of energy in a small volume, you create a black hole. And the more energy you pump in in order to get better short distance resolution, the larger is the black hole just hiding and shielding the short distance behavior that is now hidden. In the context of string theory, if we use strings instead of points to explore what happens at short distances, we cannot explore things which are shorter than the string. And again, if we try to pump more energy in, rather than getting better resolution, the string gets longer. But many of you could say, we don't care about that. We are only interested in phases of matter. We are interested in lattice models and we don't have any black holes. Why should we care about that? Well, string theory gives us another lesson, which I think is interesting. String theory has a parameter, which we can roughly think of as being Newton's constant. And we sometimes have, in fact, in most cases, we have the ability to turn it off. So if we take string theory and we take a limit when Newton constant vanishes, 
gravity decouples, and what we are left with is some degrees of freedom which interact in some way. And that is described by a local quantum field theory. In fact, over the last several decades, we've got, we got a lot of new insights about quantum field theory by doing precisely that. Take string theory, turn off Newton constant, and end up with some quantum field theory, and then we can use the string, the, start, the string starting point to learn new things about quantum field theory. And in this context, where some the first quantum counterexamples without gravity were found, that was in the previous century, first in 97 and then in 99, and they come under the name of little string theory, and the second one is field theory on non-commutative space. I'm not going to discuss this phenomena here, except to say that the term UVIR mixing was first introduced in this context of field theory in non-commutative space. And the physics of the UVIR mixing in this context is somewhat reminiscent of what we see here. What, we, what happens in this case is that the fundamental degrees of freedom are like dipoles. And as they have larger and larger momentum in the X direction, they grow physically in the Y direction. So as we try to localize energy by putting momentum in the X direction to be large, the object grows in the Y direction and affects what happens at long distances. Instead, what I'll, so I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to focus, I and the two subsequent talks, are going to focus on the exotic lattice systems. We, we have heard a lot about them in this conference and they are characterized by having a subsystem symmetry. I emphasize that it seems to me that the key thing that makes these theories interesting is not the fractons with restricted mobility. This might or might not be an outcome of the process, but the key thing is the subsystem symmetry. And we've heard quite a lot about it here. So let me make some comments about it. These systems are characterized by having exotic global symmetries. One of my principles in physics is that whenever you are confused about the system, always go after the symmetry. Because the symmetry is an uh, the global symmetry is an unambiguous characterization of the system. It doesn't matter which degrees of freedom you use, uh, whether you use Lagrangian formulation or Hamiltonian formulation, you can dualize the system and so forth. The global symmetry remains the same. So we're going to focus on the global symmetry. And as I said, not a gauge symmetry. It is unambiguous. It's independent of the presentation of the, of the theory. Now, I try to track back the origin of subsystem symmetry. So this is the common feature in all of these models. The earliest paper I found is by Loro and Fratkin. But for all I know, there could be earlier references. And there's, of course, a lot of follow-up work that I, is denoted by the ellipsis. And an example is different symmetry elements acting on different planes, but it could be more complicated. I'd like to make some comments about that, which I think are quite significant. First of all, this is a global symmetry. It is sometimes being referred to as in between gauge and global. This is really misleading. This is a global symmetry just like any other global symmetry. It might or might not be spontaneously broken. The Hilbert space is in a representation of the global symmetry and the operators are in representation of the global symmetry. This, none of that is the case for gauge symmetry. Gauge symmetry depends on the, on the way we describe the system. The operators are gauge invariant, the Hilbert space is gauge invariant. So this, is, this symmetry is a global symmetry, not in between. As I said, the states are in a representation of the symmetry. And because of the large symmetry, we can have the large ground state degeneracy. So the large ground state degeneracy is a direct consequence of the subsystem symmetry. For the purpose of this talk, we are more interested in taking the low energy limit or taking the lattice space in A, which I denoted in this color like the UV, taking it to zero. Since we have a separate symmetry element for every value as we shift the parameters on the lattice, as a result, things in the continuum limit will necessarily be discontinuous. So regardless of whether you use our presentation of the system or anything that will come in the future, the need to use discontinuous fields is unavoidable. And it can be traced back to the existence of the subsystem global symmetry. So there's clearly a one, an obvious one-to-one -one relation between them. And this is the origin of the UVIR mixing in these systems. So to summarize the UVIR mixing, which is perhaps the most interesting thing here, is a direct consequence of the, sub, of the subsystem global symmetry, and that's why we focus on it. 
Now we've written a sequence of papers over the last, it's about a year and a half, analyzing many models in two plus one and three plus one dimensions. I'm not going to give you a long laundry list of all the models we analyze. This would be boring and counterproductive. I'll only mention the general class, classes of them, and then we'll focus on one of them. So they roughly fall in two categories, models with the subsystem. So first of all, the organizing principle is the subsystem symmetry, not whether they are or they aren't fractals, not whether the fractals are line-ons or plan ons and so forth, but we organize everything according to the subsystem symmetry. And the first class is models with U1 subsystem symmetries. Most of them are gapless. And then models with discrete, say ZN subsystem symmetries, most of them are gapped. And this includes the X cube model and the checkerboard model of the Chi and Ku. So in this long sequence of papers that I'm not going to review, we reproduced from our perspective, many known properties of these models. It was long and tedious because we had to go through a lot of models and every one of them has its own peculiarities. So that was mostly in order to make sure that our formalism makes sense and we know what we're doing. But we also found many new models, new models of fractons and new models with new subsystem global symmetries. We also found some new dualities between models, both dualities between existing models and dualities between the new models in the existing one. And we also found peculiar features of them, of these uh, models that we analyzed. So instead of going through all the models, we thought we should focus on one model and mention some of its salient features. And the model was first introduced by Paramakanti, Balance and Fisher. It has subsystem symmetry. And I emphasize that it has no fractals. So this is a model with no fractals, but it does have subsystem symmetries. And it turns out that it has many of the subtleties that can, are very confusing in the more subtle models. Our experience has been that whenever we were confused about something, we went back to this elementary, more elementary model, and we got it straight there, and then we knew how to generalize. So this model will be discussed in more detail in the next talk, but let me just review roughly, re review what they are going to say in a few words. So first of all, instead of using a Hamiltonian formulation, we found it easier to use a Euclidean Lagrangian formulation. So we have lattice also in the time direction. And this is the model on the lattice. It's very reminiscent of the ordinary XY model. The difference is that in the X ordinary XY model, these terms are on the links. And here, these are terms on the plaquettes. And this is the term in the time direction that is an ordinary, the same as in the ordinary XY model. If we take a continuum limit of the time direction, then this cosine will become the second derivative with respect to time of phi. And if we go to Hamiltonian formulation, this term will be replaced by the, by the momentum conjugate to phi square. So this lattice model is well-defined. You can put it in the computer and do Monte Carlo or whatever a, a numerical scheme you like and just get the answer. And it is characterized by the, sub, the following subsystem global symmetry. We can shift phi by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. You can check that this action remains invariant. And I emphasize again, this is a global symmetry, not a gate symmetry. If we had tau dependence here and here, it would have been a gate symmetry, but that is not a symmetry of this model. So we have no time dependence, and therefore this is a global symmetry. And these author, Parmakanti, Dalens, and Fisher, also wrote a continuum model of it which is kind of very straightforward, just follow your nose. This term is the time derivative. This is a double space derivative. And this is the action in Euclidean space. So from this moment on, we can just say, let's forget where this model came from and just analyze this continuum field theory as it stands. So this is the action of this system. The first thing we see about it is that it is free, it's quadratic, it's Gaussian, it has many different names. And the common feature of all of them is that since it's quadratic in phi, there's really no obstruction to analyzing this system. It should be completely straightforward. You just go to plane waves, we diagonalize the Hamiltonian, and everything we want to know should be calculable. In fact, we computed quite a lot. We computed correlation functions, ground state, spectrum, et cetera. The first thing we learn about this model is that because of the, the structure of the derivatives here, some discontinuous field configurations are not suppressed. If 
we substitute here a function of x only, it could be a discontinuous function of x. It could jump as many times as you want. As long as it depends only on x, the action is zero. And therefore, the configuration is not suppressed. This is unlike ordinary field theories, where discontinuous field configuration are suppressed by the action. And therefore, we, shouldn't discuss, we don't have to discuss them. The second important point about this system is that it has subsystem symmetry. I already mentioned one of them, which was present already on the lattice. But in the continuum theory, there's also a second uh, emergent to one symmetry, which will be discussed in the coming talks. And finally, there's an exact set duality exchanging mu and mu zero. And this exact duality exchanges the two u1 symmetries. This again is present only on the lattice and not in the continuum. For one thing, this symmetry is not present on the lattice and this system is on the lattice. So this raised many interesting questions. This is my last slide. First of all, how much of what we said depends on the continuum limit? Can we analyze in similar ways other systems? And how much of this do we? Can we find a lattice model with these properties? More generally, how should we treat more precisely such quantum field theories with discontinuous field configuration and discontinuous observables? We would like to make the treatment more rigorous. So the answers to these questions will be in the two talks, in the two coming talks, and they are summarized in this recent paper. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. I think Hotet is the next speaker.